how many of you here are familiar with multi-level models? Just uh, majority, but not, not all of you. Okay, so they're commonly employed within social sciences because much of the data we work with is hierarchically structured. So, for instance, pupils are educated within schools, individuals live within households, within local areas, um, etc. Um, and for that reason, multi-level models are very popular in social sciences. But they can, the estimates that you, estimates that you generate from multi-level models can be quite easily criticised because multi-level models are dealing with the problem uh, that uh, those structures have, the effect that those structures have on the precision, the estimated precision of your estimates, not the bias that might be uh, included in your estimates, and so when we estimate a multi-level model we're not explicitly dealing with the potential that our models might be biased and a kind of alternative to multi-level models that also deals with structuring data are models called fixed effects models and fixed effects models their, their kind of purpose is to try and generate causal estimates from your models okay so so you can estimate uh, regression models and say X causes Y. However, in order to do that in a fixed effects framework compared to the multi-level uh, framework, you you remove a lot of uh, interesting information in the data. Okay, so it's like a throwing the baby out out with the bathwater sort of problem once you uh, implement fixed effects models. So there's a b debate as to which method you should use when you're dealing with this sort of structured social data. Um, so the two methods sort of are kind of preferred by different different disciplines okay so to put it kind of crudely multi-level models they view the, that sort of structure that I've talked about in the social world as being something of interest something that you want to model and something that can, can provide you information about what you're interested in whereas fixed effects models treat that structure as a problem that you have to try and remove from your analysis in order to get to causality so choosing between them is kind of determined by the type of research question that you're asking. So if I'm asking the sort of question that says, what are all the various factors that might, might be associated with an individual level outcome, I might prefer a multi-level model. If my research question is very specific, that's asking, does a given explanatory variable causally affect an outcome, then I might prefer a fixed effects model. And for that reason, you see different disciplines going towards different types of modelling. So in sociology, where research questions are often interested in how uh, social context is related to individual outcomes, you, they, uh, people working in te sociology tend to use multi-level models. In education, where uh, commonly uh, people are interested in the effects of different types of schools on pupil level outcomes, they use multi-level models. Where in economics, where the research questions tend to be a more, I suppose, focused on a, on a particular variable, then they tend to use fixed effects models. So, for example, in, in education, you might ask, uh, do the management styles of different schools affect pupils differently? Whereas an economist might ask, um, what is the effect, what is the causal effect on class size on uh, on uh, pupil level outcomes. Just to give you a note on terminology, most level models are also called random effects models, especially uh, in economics, and it's sometimes noted as MLM. And really confusingly, people who work mainly with multi level models will call their coefficients in their model fixed effects, um, which kind of confuses things a bit, but, but we're talking about multi level models versus fixed effects models in this talk. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate um, why you might prefer to use fixed effects models uh, by two examples. And I guess th there's two types of hierarchies we can consider in, in social data. One is what you're probably most familiar with, which is what I call cross sectional hierarchies. So, and that's pupils within schools, individuals within households, etc. And the specific example I'm going to look at is the question of whether there are peer effects in schools. So whether the pupils 
as a group exert an effect on an individual pupil in terms of their outcomes. The second example I'm going to use is what I call a longitudinal hierarchy, where each measurement of a person is also nested within that person. Okay, so it's a hierarchy, and I'll show that with a diagram in a second. And the spe specific question that I'm considering is, what's the effect of divorce on children? Okay, or and even more specifically, what's the effect on children's behaviour of parental divorce? Um, quite a relevant policy question, and also there's a lot of research done on that. Okay. So just to give you a brief overview of multi-level models, um, where there's structure in the data, multi-level models should be considered. Okay, so consider the classic example of pupils within schools. Um, in this diagram here, each small box here represents a pupil and the large box represents a school. So there's six pupils in school A and six pupils in school B. And because you've had that sort of hierarchy, that's possibly why multi-level modelling is so popular within education research. And I'll refer from now on to this level of the data, so the school level data with the big block is called the higher level unit. Okay. You may hear, hear this re referred to as level one and level two units in multi-level modelling. Other than pupils within schools, we might also have other sort of cross-sectional hierarchies like these within citizens, within countries, people within neighbourhoods, siblings within families, players within a sports team, anything where there's a coherent higher level group. Um, for uh, individual level data, then we will consider multi-level modelling. Now the second type of multi-level model is uh, hierarchically structured, but, but perhaps less obvious, and this, this is the longitudinal hierarchical data. So if I have two individuals here, individual A and individual B, I might measure them at six time points, okay, so maybe over six years. So in year one, I see their outcome, year two, I see measure their outcome, three, four, five, six etc. for both individuals. So I'm measuring individuals over time. And in this example, it's the individual that's the higher level unit in this multi-level model. And of course, multi-level models can also cope with a lot more complex structures as well, which is one of their real attractions. So I might see an individual within a family, within a school over time, or individuals observed over time within a family, within a school account for changes in schools and we also have different family members that go to different schools so you get very complicated sort of structures and multi-level modeling kind of offers a kind of a really flexible way of accounting for that structure so i don't want to go into too, too much algebra in this talk but it's, it's, it's really conceptual rather than um, being technical um, and this is the only algebra i think here but how does multi-level modelling actually recognise that sort of structure in the data? Well, in a normal regression model with two levels, say a pupil within a school, we'd have an outcome of pupil I within school J equals constant plus individual level variables plus coefficient times a school level variable, and then an individual level error. Okay, so the bit that the, the, the model can't uh, estimate the explanatory variables. Now, the way that multi-level modelling helps us is that it says that actually this unknown bit at the end can be partitioned into the higher level unknown bit and the individual level sort of unknown bit. So it's really saying that there is an unknown bit of the model that's common, if you use the education example, that's common to all pupils within a school, as well as an unknown section of the model that's specific to each individual. And what's and just to state that the errors, the, the, the assumptions you make around these errors are just the same as the usual OS assumptions of independence, normality and constant variance. So what does that do? Well it means that our standard errors on our coefficients here um, are not downwardly biased. Okay? If you estimate a model like this without taking into account the partitioned error, then you get estimate these coefficients too precisely. Okay? And you make a risk, you, you run the risk of committing type two type one, sorry, type two one error. That is finding statistically significant effects 
of these variables when it's really just due to randomness. Okay. Um, so it allows us to estimate the standard errors and precision more correctly. But it's also a kind of flexible structure for estimating how the relationships or the coefficients vary between contexts. Okay, so just to give an example uh, that I thought of is that in education it's quite common to observe gender differences within uh, within different subjects. On average, uh, females tend to be better in English, uh, males tend to be better in maths, and that's on average. And the question might be, well, does that sort of gender gap vary much between schools? And multi-level models will allow you to estimate the extent to which that gender gap varies between schools. We might also add in an interaction called a cross-level interaction that might tell, her, tell us what the different contextual factors are that affect how the gender gap varies between schools. Thanks. Yes. Um, so we start to build up a very sort of complex model, and because it's becoming more complex, it's more kind of likely to reflect what's actually happening in the real world. Just to give an example for peer effects in schools then, um, so we have pupils in school A and pupils in school B, and one of the ways we might estimate what's the effect of being educated amongst these peers compared to these peers is just say, oh sorry, is, is compare pupils in the different schools. and. The example I've given here is quite a sort, of, a sort of policy issue and it's about the inclusion of pupils with special educational needs within mainstream schools. So special educational needs is an educational sort of data category that includes pupils with learning difficulties and physical disabilities. And by an active policy debate it's been around whether pupils with STEM schools should be included in mainstream schools. And one of the questions is what the effect of this inclusion is on other people. Okay? So if I wanted to estimate the effect of STEM peers on other pupils, then we could compare one school. So in this example, the yellow dots are STEM peers and the, the blue dots are non-STEM peers. So I could compare the outcomes of these pupils in school A with the outcomes of the pupils in school B. And then that might might use a lot of assumptions and you might argue that that gives you the effect of sending kids. Okay. And uh, once you extend that to many other schools with varying levels of, of STEM, um, you can do a multi-level model of that. The second example in terms of the longitudinal hierarchy is looking at the effect of uh, divorce on children. So in this diagram, I've taken the, the individual longitudinal data structure and consider the yellow boxes to be years in which the parents of individual A are divorced. Okay, so for years one, two, three, parents are together, for years four, five, six, the parents are divorced. Whereas for individual B, the parents are together throughout the whole period of analysis. Okay, that's what that diagram is showing you. Now, with this structure, we can use multi-level models to estimate the effect of uh, that event on a, an individual's outcome. So in this example, it could be the effect on that child's behavior. Now, an important thing to note with this sort of longitudinal vector <coughs> is that we have two types of variation that is, that is, uh, that is estimating the effect of the course. So firstly, we're comparing individual A with individual B and saying, does the behavior outcomes, are they any better or worse for individual A compared to individual B? The second sort of comparison we're making is that within individual A, are the outcomes for the first three years better or worse than the outcomes for the latter three years when the parents are divorced, okay? And that's the sources of variation that are giving us the estimate of the effect of the rules of children's behaviour. Okay, so it's important to, to recognise that between variation, between the higher level units and within the higher level units, is the variation that's generating our estimated effect. Now, because we have those two sources of variation, 
one of the, the strengths of multi-level modeling is that it doesn't only just generate the correct standard errors for those estimates, it efficiently weights the contribution of both the, the between and within variation to generating our, our own overall estimated effect. Okay. So it gives us the best sort of uh, estimate given the, the, the structure of the data that we have. Okay, so 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 far so good with multi-level modeling. Um, but there's a problem, and the problem comes on both pupils in schools, and also you see this between comparison there, and for comparing children, the between comparison there. <coughs> the problem comes because that between comparison is well, it's quite likely that there's a sort of bias in making those sort of comparisons between individuals or between schools in each of those examples. And if there's bias in those sort of comparisons, then we can't make any sort of causal cool inference from that results. Before I go into that into a bit more detail, there is one other problem with multi-level modelling that's quite specific to small data sets that we need to be aware of. And that's when we, when we, we might have a very big sample size, say 2,000 people, but, if, but multi level model requires sample sizes both at the individual level and at the higher level unit level, okay? And in studies that I've seen, they tend to recommend that you need at least sort of 50 higher level units in order to use multi level modeling, so it's quite high. The other sort of assumption that multi-level modeling makes is that you're, it's not just your people who are randomly sampled, it's also your higher level units that are randomly sampled. So if in education, our schools should be randomly sampled as well as our pupils within the schools. Now, this is often not a problem because quite a lot of the time, multi-level models are used on survey data or administrative data that, that's quite large. However, multi-level modeling is quite commonly used within cross-country and in cross-country data sets, we often have very, very few countries that we're working with. Okay, and it's very un quite unusual to have country-level data with more than 50 countries. Okay, do we have a random sample of countries? Well, often we have OECD countries, you know, rather than a random sample of countries. So it's not strictly random, and that affects your sort of general stability of your results. So. There's a working paper that I've got a reference for uh, at the end of this presentation um, to refer to if, if you do have sort of concerns about your higher level units uh, not being sufficient to do multi level modeling. But the key problem of working with multi level models is when we try and make causal inference. So the general sort of assumption in regression modeling is that if we want to interpret our coefficients as causal effects, then our explanatory variables can't be correlated with the error term. Now, in non-statistical language, all that's saying is that if we see that our variable of interest, that x variable, is related to the outcome variable, we must be sure that there's no third variable that's actually causing both variation in our x variable and in our y variable, okay? Because otherwise, our observed relationship between the x variable and the y variable will just be a reflection of that unobserved variable. Now, why is this such a problem in multi-level modelling? Well, the problem is, is that often the unobserved confounders or the unobserved variables we're not controlling for, they often operate at that higher level in multi-level models. Okay? Now, for example, in the peer effects uh, uh, example that I gave is you can't distinguish in a multi level model between the effect of being in a group, okay, so the effect of being in a certain neighborhood or the effect of being in a certain school from the reason for being in a group. Um, I'll show the example uh, in schools in a second, but in the neighborhood, neighbor, neighborhood effects research, we know that people self select these neighborhoods, they choose to live in particular neighbourhoods, all their choices are constrained by other variables. And we don't know whether their outcomes are a result of the neighbourhood that we, they live in, 
or as a result of the variables that are causing them to self-select or do constraints to select into certain neighborhoods. The problem in longitudinal analysis is that the propensity for individuals to experience a change in the variable of interest is often determined by other pre-existing variables that vary between individuals and also affect outcomes. Now this is especially true of the example that I gave, which is the effect of divorce on children, okay? Because the characteristics of the uh, parents who are more likely to get divorced are different from the characteristics of parents who um, are less likely to get divorced, okay? And it may be those differences that are actually driving the changes in the outcomes of the children that we observe. So just to kind of formalise this sort of concern within a structure, what we observe in our model, if we don't control for this variable, what we observe in our model is this relationship here, what we think is this relationship here. But if we don't control for that in our model, then we don't know what we're seeing here is not just a result of these causal sort of processes here. And I'll illustrate this diagram with both the examples that I have. So, in the first example about um, what's the effect of SEM is on other pupils within the class, well, there's two sorts of bias really. Firstly is that SEM pupils might go to certain types of school. In fact, that's more than a concern, that's actually true in the data, that schools with high levels of socioeconomic disadvantage also tend to have high levels of SEM. Uh, peers within the school. Okay, so when we model the association between SEM peers and the outcomes of pupils in the school, we don't perfectly control the socioeconomic disadvantage. We can't be sure that what we're observing isn't just a manifestation of socioeconomic uh, disadvantage. A related concern in this example is about selection bias, really. And that's the certain types of pupils might be more or less likely to encounter SEM peers based on unobserved pupil characteristics that are related to how well they do at school. And the usual example used in peer effects is parental motivation. So parents may actively choose schools that do not that have a lower level of SEM peers. Okay, so those parents might be more interested in their, their child's education, but that interest is also something that drives how well they do at school. So we can't tell what's the causal effect of SEM peers. So you just see in this diagram, this is what we observe in our model, percentage of SEM experienced by the child and their test score, the effect from the test score, but we don't know that that might just be a manifestation of a common variable parental motivation. Okay, and in the second example, in the effect of divorce on children, um, we know that those who live and are uh, more socioeconomically disadvantaged are more likely to get divorced. Okay? If we don't control for that, we can't estimate the effect of divorce on, on children um, because we also know that it affects uh, behaviour as well. And there's other variables that relate to, to within family effects that also affect both chance of being uh, divorced and also children's behaviour. So just take one of them, parental stress, that might cause divorce, it might also affect the children's behaviour, but if we don't control for it, all we see is an association between divorce and children's behaviour that's actually spurious. Okay, so how do fix effects models solve this? Well, they don't totally solve it, but they help to. Remember I spoke before about between variation. Multi-level models use comparisons between different schools or between different individuals in the longitudinal example. The fixed effects models get rid of all that between variation. So any variation between higher level units is gone from the fixed effects model. Okay? And this means that any fixed unobserved differences between higher level units can no longer bias the estimates. If you're kind of familiar with using controls and statistical models, then using a fixed effects model is like someone giving to you every single control variable you need at that high level. Okay, so 
on the face of it, it seems quite a good thing. You know, it's, it's good control for every single variable that's unobserved and fixed over time uh, at the higher level. It's also quite simple to do. Multi-level modeling can get very, very complicated. It can be very, very slow because it has to estimate parameters in a model using, often using iterations. So estimating models and then doing it again, doing it again, doing it. Fixed effects models are commonly estimated by the release squares. Um, so it's a lot quicker and it's a lot simpler as well. Just to give a bit of information on how fixed effects models actually work, there's two ways of looking at them. One is what's called the least squares dummy variable uh, method. And so that's to assume that each higher level unit is the dummy variable. So a one, zero uh, variable, depending on whether an individual is in a particular high level unit. Um, so if you remember, I showed you the multi-level model with the UJ as the uh, high level effects or the high level residual. Well now that's just a dummy variable representing each, say, school in the case of uh, pupils within schools. Um, and these dummy variables are what I was just describing a second ago. They act as a control for everything that happens at that level. Okay? So it's it's a really to think of it as a really detailed, powerful statistical control at higher level. A second way of thinking about fixed effects models is that they transform every variable in the model into a deviation from the higher level unit mean. It's quite complicated to kind of explain uh, in this context, but, but the idea is quite simple. It, it, in that the actual research question that the, 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 the model is kind of asking is whether the deviation of the outcome variable around its mean, high level mean, is related to corresponding deviation of variables of interest from its mean. Now, actually, it's probably easiest to kind of illustrate that with, with the with the horse example. Okay. So what it what it's saying is that for a particular individual, yeah, you have a uh, and use the child's behaviour an example. Yeah. If there's an average level of behaviour, is the periods when the parents have divorced is the behaviour. Uh, better or worse compared to that average overall for that particular uh, individual. And that's what the within transformation does. That's actually the, the method by which all the statistical passive, uh, packages um, implement fixed effects. Using the within transformation or the dummy variable method doesn't really matter because it actually produces identical results and has the same effect of people eliminating the higher higher level unit variation. So just to go back to my example of group fixed effects, we have the problem that estimating the effect of SEM peers comparing school A and school B could be biased by differences between school A and school B and also differences between the types of pupils in school A and school B. So we can't identify the causal effect of SEM peers. Yeah. So to use fixed effects to solve this problem, what we could do is to look at multiple cohorts within those schools and implement a school fixed effects, which is this bold line here. Okay. So what's just to explain this diagram, for pupils who finished this school in 2009, there were two SEM peers. For those that finished in 2008, four. For those that finished in 2007, there were three. And do the same thing for the school B. Now, what fixed effects models do is they make sure that none of the estimated effect of SEM peers on these pupils' test scores is generated by comparing these pupils with these pupils. Okay? It partitions the analysis. So we're not comparing schools with each other. All we're going to do is compare this cohort's results with this co cohort's results with that one, and the same for school B as well. Okay. So can you see how that completely removes any bias of comparing different schools? Because you're not, you're not using any of that variation to generate your estimate. We could also use a multi-level model on this sort of structure of data. However, multi-level models get rid of that sort of partition and they allow comparing these pupils with these pupils and their outcomes. 
And we might be worried that that sort of comparison might introduce sort of like bias into our estimates. So, so what do we find in the literature? Well, what we find in the literature is that fixed effects models, these sort of pure effects, tend to find smaller effects than multi-level models, okay? What that's telling us is that that between variation, comparing between schools, might be actually reflecting the sort of selection biases that I spoke about earlier. What's the fixed effects model doing in this instance? It's estimating the peer effect by comparing pupils within the same school but in different cohorts within that school. Okay? And the assumption to generate causal estimates is that that cohort to cohort variation within peer group, in peer groups within a school is random. Okay? There may be reasons why that assumption may not hold, but <coughs> it's an easier assumption to make than the assumption that SEM peers are randomly allocated between schools, which is what a multi-level model would make. To use the example of longitudinal data, <coughs> if we use a multi-level model on what's the effect of divorce on children's behaviour, well, say we have three time periods, 2007, 2008, 2009. This time, each one of these columns is one individual. So Say this is individual one, you see them in 2007, their parents are together, in 2008 their parents are divorced, in 2009 their parents are still divorced, okay? So for individual, individual five, individual five, throughout the period, three periods of analysis, we see that parents are together for all that time. Now how, using a multi-level model, the estimate of the effect of divorce on uh, children's behavioral outcomes We'd use both this variation over time, okay, so does what happens to individual one, does their behaviour improve or get worse with the divorce? We would also use the comparison between individuals. So is the behaviour of individual one different from individual five, okay, given that they have different exposure to divorce? As I've said, there's a source of bias in making those sort of between individual comparisons. So what does fixed effects do? Well, it puts those hard partitions between individuals and says, we're making no comparisons between individuals in our analysis at all. All we're going to be interested in is whether for each individual, whether their outcomes change once they have a, tradition, a transition from the parents going together to the parents being divorced. Okay? Now, this quite neatly illustrates one of the problems with fixed effects models. Okay? So, not only have we got rid of all this variation between individuals that might be informative, we also effectively get rid of all the individuals in our data set who have no variation over time, okay? Because if fixed effects are saying for each individual, how does their behaviour change with their transition? And if there's no transition, then that individual contributes nothing to that estimation, okay? So we get rid of all the between variation and we also effectively get rid of a lot of our data as well. So what actually happens in the literature? Well, Fixed effects models of divorce and childhood outcomes, especially behaviour, tend to find, I think, much smaller effects than multi-level models, and in some cases zero effects, okay? So you see a lot of sort of policy arguments that say that we should encourage marriage, marriage or encourage couples to send, uh, stay together because the outcomes for the children are much better when the parents stay together. But actually what the sort of results from the literature suggest was that those effects are actually due to pre-existing differences that are nothing to do with where, whether the parents stay together or not. Okay, and I've said that second bullet, that we exclude a lot of cases where there's no change in state. So I've touched on the problem with, with uh, fixed effect models. Um, just to explain them in a bit more detail, because we get rid of so much much variation in our data in fixed effects models, what we're left with is also often quite a small amount of data, okay? So if we take the example of 
the percentage of STEM pupils within schools, we'd expect that percentage to vary a lot more between schools than it does from year to year within a school. Okay? And if we're just looking at the year to year variation, then uh, the size of the variation is small. And this causes problems because, firstly, any errors that we have in the measurement of that expansion variable are much, much, certainly much, much more important, okay? Because we're only dealing with a small amount of variation. So as a proportion of overall variation, measurement error is a lot more influential. And measurement error tends to reduce our coefficient estimates to zero, okay? So it means that we risk making type two error. The second problem with that small amount of variation left in the data is that you, it's much more difficult to pick up non-linearities. And by non-linearities, I mean things like threshold effects. Um, finally, um, it relates to sort of the, the problem of measurement error is that because the amount of variation left in our, our data is small, and we've excluded a lot of cases effectively, potentially, our analysis has much lower power, okay? And low power means that we have a higher risk of, of uh, hitting type 2 error, okay? It's less likely that our modeling will find an effect even when a true effect exists in the population. So there are kind of the problems around the lack of variation, but even when you still have the variation in the data, sorry, even when you, when you have, still have a lot of variation in the data, remember you're still eliminating all between high level unit variation. And you might be interested in that sort of variation. You might be interested in what causes people in one school to do better than the people in another school, especially true in education, or why certain people in certain neighborhoods earn more than, than people in other neighbourhoods, okay? But you can't do that in fixed effects models because with a fixed effects model, you can't include any other variable at a higher level unit because you've taken out all the variation using the fixed effects. Using random slopes models, um, so that's asking, does the effect of a variable vary between higher level units? It's very easy to do within multi-level models. With fixed effects, it's possible you have to interact the variable that you're interested in with every fixed effect that you have, okay? And I work with a data set that has 16,000 schools in it, and that would involve estimating a model with 16,000 interactions in, in the model. Impossible to do, okay? And just the last point is that although we usually do use fixed effects models to get rid of all that bias in the higher level units, it only gets rid of the bias that's caused by fixed uh, unobserved variables, so variables that are fixed over time. So for instance, in the effect of divorce on children's behaviour example, although it could control for, say, poverty that's permanent throughout the child's uh, period of analysis, it couldn't control for, say, parental job loss during that period. Okay? If job loss causes divorce, and we don't control for job loss in that in that uh, in that longitudinal model, then fixed effects still are not going to identify the effect of divorce and separate that out from the effect of the job loss. Okay? So it only controls for things that are constant over time. So the final question is which one should you use? Well in economics, it's quite common to use what's called a Hausman test. And this is a statistical test comparing what they would usually call a Coyle random effects model, but in social science, most social scientists call it a multi level model, um, comparing the results of that with the results of the fixed effects model that you have. Okay? And the Hausman test really just asks the question how different are those multi level estimates from your fixed effects estimates? I guess the implicit assumption in this, this test is that the fixed effects model is uh, unbiased, okay? So if your multi-level estimates are significantly different from your fixed effects estimates, then you'd be worried about bias and you'd choose fixed effects. Whereas if your multi-level estimates are quite similar to your fixed effects estimates, then you'd proceed using the multi-level 
estimates. And the reason that you've used the multi-level model when you can is because they're using all that data and all the variation, whereas the fixed effects models, remember, they get rid of so much data and so much information from the data set. So that's how to test it formally, but I, I actually prefer to think of the choice as, as, as really being about judgment. Now, there's a working paper on using multi-level models or fixed effects models in education research that there's a reference for at the end. And their advice is that when the selection mechanism is fairly well understood, so the reason for people belonging to a higher unit, and the researcher have access to rich data, the random effects model should be naturally preferred, so that's the multi-level model should be preferred, because it can produce policy relevant estimates while allowing a wider range of research questions to be addressed. That's certainly true. Multi-level models, because they use a lot more data, they allow you to interrogate the, the data a lot more, so they allow a wider range of research questions. However, this sounds quite positive, but actually I read it as being quite negative about multi-level models, because these two conditions, when the selection mechanism is fairly well understood and the researcher has access to rich data, they're quite difficult conditions to conform to. So I work a lot with education data, and we rarely have the data to model the choices of parents in terms of where they send their children to school, for instance. And also, with administrative data, often you don't have very rich data on, on, on your research question. So that kind of quote would suggest that you should probably prefer fixed effects uh, in most cases. However, I kind of advocate using both. At least, you know, in your analysis, you may not want to kind of, if you're writing up your analysis, you may not want to include both. But certainly in your analysis, I think you should consider both. Firstly, because multi-level models have powerful descriptive uses, because they can describe variation between high-level units, like schools, between neighbors that fixed effects models can't do. And if your data allows you to, I think multi-level estimates should be checks, not using the Hausman test, but just, just kind of comparing the two estimates from the two different types of models. Because actually, the discrepancies and the similarities between the two are quite informative. If we see that the multi-level model is very different from the fixed effect model, it suggests, well one, it suggests there might be a high level of bias in, in comparing the high level units. Um, it might suggest that we haven't got an adequate amount of control variables at a high level. Um, but it also might suggest that the kind of causal mechanisms that are going on work differently within, say, a school than between schools. So it provides you with a, comparing the two estimates actually is quite informative about your data. If you are concerned about bias in your multi-level modeling and don't want to go into the fixed effect world, then there is a method of staying within multi-level modeling. And well, a couple of methods. One is to take the mean of every individual level variable and use that as a contextual level variable at a high level unit in the multi-level model. Okay? That controls for as much between variation as you can do without uh, getting rid of all variation at a high level unit as you would fixed effect model. The second, the second technique is a little more complicated um, and some people refer to it as a hybrid model um, and that involves estimating the between the effects of the between variation and the within variation within the same model. I haven't written that down there but I can tell you about more about that if you want to um, it's quite straightforward to, to estimate both multi-level models and fixed effects models. I use data, and it's just a simple uh, X and Y command. So just to summarise, if you're working with structured data, as we often are in social science, um, consider these two questions. Are you interested in estimating a causal relationship? You may not be. You might be just interested in... in in trying to describe the data and estimating associations, which a lot of quantitative work in social science does. But if you are interested in estimating causal relationship, ask yourself whether you have concerns that there might be bias in unobserved, in not accounting for unobserved high level variables that will affect your estimation of that relationship. And if you answer those both questions with a yes, then you should really be looking at using fixed effects models.
but as I've said, there's no harm in considering uh, using both models. And I actually think that when you're actually kind of exploring the data, you should probably analyze your data using both. 